Tim Flowers, and uh, he was working Timothy for Mike Flowers. Diamond Timmy C. Flowers. Yeah, great, great wrestler, so so human being. But you know, when he's working LaBelle, my friend Lloyd and I used to go to the uh, Anton Leone shows that were promoted in Bakersfield. You know, that was yes. you know briefly. Wouldn't call it really competition with LaBelle because they didn't really run each other's cities. However, uh, it was announced that Dr. Jerry Graham was going to be there, and Tim Flowers, Dr. Jerry Graham was one of his trainers. And so he said, oh, right. my God, we got to go see the doc. And so that first night, you know, he's powwowing with the doc. And then at the end of the evening, John Tolis, and this was John Tolis's greatest work ever. John Tolis walks up to me, and this, <laughs> this was when I was about 110 pounds and had this big, giant, bleach blonde afro. I looked like a walking Q-tip. And Tolis walks up to me and says, uh, young man, um, I was informed you lived in the L.A. area, and I'm going, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, listen, you know, I'm kind of in Woodland Hills, which is a bit out of the way of L.A., and that's where Dr. Jerry Graham lives. Would you do me a big favor and could you give him a ride home? And I'm like, the, the, the Dr. Jerry Graham, I, yeah, yeah, of course, yes. So I'm, I'm like on cloud nine. And the reason I say it was Tolis's greatest work is because he didn't so much as snicker or crack a grin. He just, <laughs> of, of course, maybe, uh, maybe that was self uh, preservation because he didn't want to drive sure. Doc home again. And so Doc came out and was, well, hello, young man. How are you? And he shakes my hand, and he's super charming, super suave. And Big cigar. Well, he got the cigars a little later in the evening. It was uh, oh, after I the masses concluded. I had been I had been drinking some, so Tim Flowers was driving, and the docks, uh, you know, but it was my car. Uh, so as we're driving down Highway 99, Doc says, hey, can we stop at the store? I just want to get a couple of beers. And I'm thinking to myself, eh, I shouldn't really let people get in my car, but eh, it's Dr. Jerry Graham. Uh, little did I know what I was uh, accepting. So he comes out of the liquor store with a couple of beers, a couple of bottles of wine, a couple of bottles of hard stuff, and that's where the cigars come in. He had a pocket full of cigars he stole from the liquor store <laughs> and just took them all out and threw them in the back seat at us. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, ah, cigars from heaven. <laughs> Enjoy. Oh, okay. And then I I saw him do his Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde where he started drinking and started letting out his, yeah, his war cry. And when he would finish a bottle of something, he threw it out the window onto the highway without even checking to see if there was a car in the next lane. And he's, you know, doing his, you suck your mother's uh, cry. And I'm just saying, oh, God, please let us get home safely and then <laughs> not long after he has uh, one bottle of I think it was I can't remember if it was whiskey or bourbon but he's like holy shit I actually can't finish I cannot finish the rest of this bottle I oh what the hell and then he waters my dashboard with the liquor like it's a garden and I'm flipping out and saying what the hell are you doing and he just very casually says eh, so somebody quiet this kid if somebody got a pipe just hit him on the head he'll be okay tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the night, I said, oh, I'm never going to hang with that guy again. But, you know, a week later, oh, man, he was addicting. <laughs> oh, something else. What a great character. A legendary story of him. I believe he was driving with somebody and told him to pull over uh, on the side of the road. And he, he stripped down, dove into a lake, and came up with a fish in his mouth. <laughs> I think it's a Terry Funk story, actually. You've never heard that one? I believe one? it. If it was if it was anyone but Dr. Jerry Graham, I would not believe it. But And then, and then but of I course, believe. Uh, the, the other classic, of course, is, of course, the situation with him and his deceased mother. Yes, yes. You want to talk about that for a second? Oh, we're going yeah. a little bit off That's... topic here. You know, we're talking about the evolution of wrestling culture. But, you know, <laughs> and, and, and actually... This story is so absurd. It's something that could not happen in today's society. It just couldn't happen. Go ahead, Vandal. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? Whenever I tell Dr. Jerry Graham stories, and I suspect people won't believe them because they're so out there, I give them proof and show them like a newspaper clipping of that. What happened was in the, I always forget if it was 68 or 69, but his mother, who was like, probably the most important person in his life, was in very bad health. He, I guess, warned the doctor, she better recover. Well, she didn't recover. She passed. And so he took, I believe it was his son, Jim, 
who was 12 years old. And so he, he uh, took his son, Jim, to the hospital where his mother had just passed away, armed with a gun and a hunting knife. And just uh, w- when people were trying to say, uh, sir, sir, uh, you got to back off. He just pushed him out of the way and said, I, I just want to bury my mother. So he uh, got his mother's body. And I always forget whether he, he took the body out on um, a gurney or if he had her over his road. Over. Yeah, that's what I heard. Well, here's the, that's the other funny thing. This is the most outlandish tale, but Rock Rims and I were discussing this a couple months back. It's a crazy tale as it is, but people insist on making it crazier. Like there were people claiming that he put the body in a car and took the body fishing. Uh, another one that he was running down the street and tried to bury in a vacant lot. Now, he he made it out to the parking lot, and one of the officers I later learned was somebody who was a, a relative of his wife, and he was able to, like, talk some sense into Jerry, but not before Jerry, like, plowed his a hunting knife. I think he would telephone pole or something. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think there was another incident about a month later where uh, he was making a ruckus in his front yard dressed only in his wrestling trunks, you know, I guess giving the neighborhood a show. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there... I, I I remember I late at night driving home from Bakersfield, just stuff you you didn't think you were with a silent movie comedian. You thought you were in a silent movie comedy because he'd be so wrecked, and he did this several times. Like, where like with Fatty Arbuckle, pulled... exactly, exactly. Fatty what, Arbuckle, what he would do? Yeah, he was a big boozer. Yeah. Big guy, and, just and, like and Dr. What, Jerry. And what Doc would do was he'd, he'd take a cigarette, and then he'd have a book of matches, and he would go to light the cigarette, and every time the match would go out before he got the cigarette lit. And <laughs> I swear to God, he'd go through an entire like book of matches. Or something. <laughs> exactly, that's what it is. And, and when, the, when, when, when the matches were gone, he'd start going, Fire! Fire! I need fire! God damn it! Uh, and, what, and one night he pulled out the cigarette lighter from my car and, and held it from the wrong end and then let out a loud scream a few minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and, and I, I, there was this, also this K-Rock show, the new wave station that was big in the early 80s. They had some show called Rock and Religion that was kind of like that uh, Saturday Night Live sketch, uh, Sprockets, you know, that they have yes. this really know-it-all host who and he introduces the show one night just saying, you know, our first, our first song is by a man who has the most utopian visions and can bring us to a higher plane, Gary Newman, and he's playing the song Our Friends Electra, and Doc is just like, just has this amazed look in his face. Oh, my God. Who is this man? I'm going, that, that's Gary Newman, Doc. He goes, oh, yeah, he's beautiful. <laughs> and he just looks at me and says, you call him on the phone. You understand me? You call him on the phone. Tell him that Dr. Graham would like to talk with him about life. And he was dead serious, too. He, he wanted to talk philosophy with Gary Newman. <laughs> there will never be <laughs> another character like Dr. Jerry Graham in it. It's no surprise. I don't know, uh, you know, how many listeners are aware of this. I don't know if you're aware of this, James, but uh, Vince McMahon uh, Jr. Uh, idolized Dr. Jerry. In mm-hmm. fact, he wanted to be a member of the Graham family, and I believe he was about to bleach his hair blonde, even. But he just loved Dr. Jerry, and actually wanted to bring him back in the, um, I believe it was like the late '80s as a manager. But I don't know what happened there. If uh, <laughs> Doc, I'm well, sure there's a crazy Doc. story surrounding why um, Dr. Cherry uh, didn't last long. Yeah, he, you know, I, I guess he walked a straight line for a few weeks, and then I guess he showed up at, I don't know if it was Titan Towers back then, but wherever uh, Vince McMahon was perched, he just kind of burst in, and Dr. Jerry, you know, form, you know, three sheets to the wind. He said, oh, I walked in, and... Uh, uh, Vince says, uh, Jerry, I'm having a meeting right now. And he says, oh, yeah, I know who these three guys are. Your name's Huey. Your name's Dewey. Your name's Louie. You're from the IRS. I owe you a million dollars, and I dare you to try to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, wow. And then, and then I guess, I guess uh, one of the IRS guys is uh, trying to, like, you know, 
calmed Jerry down and said, oh, I heard you were in the 82nd Airborne. So was I. And I guess Doc said his, his response was, yeah, well, where were you when the bullets were flying? <laughs> <laughs> so that so created according enough, to he, doc he, yeah yeah and, and and mcmahon jr i think would have given him a lot more chances if it didn't get so extreme I, from what i understand vince senior gave doc more chances than he would have given uh normal people because you know when he wasn't totally out of hand he could be really charming very oh he could draw very fascinating to talk with yeah <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah the famous tag team match from the garden with Rocco and perez Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, against the Grahams with, uh, he did team with um, Crazy Luke, didn't he, that night? Yes, he did. I, I um, it was. I, not that, was it that night? That's I what think, I'm thinking. I'm not sure if Luke was in the mix. I think Luke wasn't quite in the mix yet, I, but I, I might be wrong. I forget but. who Graham teamed with, but there was a huge riot at the Garden that's yep. documented in newspaper reports. And just the incredible heat. And, uh, oh, it was yeah. with the Bruiser. He teamed with the Bruiser, oh, and they were okay. against Carpentier and Rocca. Oh, it was Carpentier and Rocca. Okay. Yeah, and something I didn't learn until just a couple of years ago is apparently right in the middle of the riot, both Rocca and the Doc stopped trying to subdue fans because they were looking in fascination with Bruiser, I guess, was just snatching fans and just chucking them like potatoes out of the ring as they tried to get in. Wow. But yeah, that, I mean, that that's the stuff of legend. If you go onto a newspaper archive site, site and go to 1957 and type in Doc and Rocca's name, uh, you'll find dozens and dozens of articles covering it it made nationwide news yeah and i don't think we'll ever see anything like that again at least not here in the united states i mean maybe we we don't need that type of publicity anymore but it's definitely something that i don't think we'll ever <laughs> witness again